All right, thank you for joining the ESBC Podcast uh, Network, Faith, Family, and Football. And we're fortunate and lucky and good to have a guy that I followed his whole career. And it's almost like modern life now, where there's so much information where you can follow a guy like Max Brown that I'm very proud of, and I want to congratulate him on uh, his career, man. Thanks, Max, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is uh... – this is great, and uh, yeah, happy to talk with your audience. Yeah, and here's a story from the jump, man, that uh, inspires me. And, and, you know, somebody that you have absolutely no idea who they are, we just met. Uh, you've helped me make money, man, going to a business meeting and kind of have that, that energy. And this is on the lines of the Faith and Family Football podcast we've done with Corey Jackson. He goes to, uh, you know, at a, goes to a JC to play basketball. The coach doesn't accept them. And he tears the guys up on the court. He, the coach gives him clothes. Next thing you know, he's at Nevada at the Sweet 16. And the football coach gets him to play the last year. Long story short, uh, you know, he becomes an undrafted free agent, plays six years in the NFL. Then you have John Bronson at, at Penn State with Joe Paterno. Then he plays for the Arizona Cardinals. And he's there with Matt Leinart, man, that you're part of that amazing, incredible tradition of being a, uh, a starter at USC in a, an iconic school. And just that, man, and, and I want to drill that into people, just that accomplishment is phenomenal and more than what people do their whole entire life, Max. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't take that lightly. Um, like you, yeah, like, like you said, I mean, uh, the, being the, the quarterback at USC, it's that's uh, that's a top level outside of like getting to the NFL. That's 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 it's quite the accomplishment. I don't lose track of that, but I'm also aware of kind of where I stand on that pecking order in terms of uh, kind of where how things worked out per se. Uh, and I, I want to I, I speak a lot to that uh, just in in terms of uh, I don't necessarily have the the biggest name a lot of those guys do, but uh, I still try to. Uh, try to speak up and I haven't, uh, haven't lost track of how big, uh, big a deal that is. And no, I appreciate you saying something. Yeah, no. And, and I think about John Bronson, right? John Bronson, uh, they made him change positions at Penn state, uh, from, because he's an athlete from being, uh, you know, middle linebacker to offense. You have to learn the offense and he showed a ton of mental, uh, mental strength, which is a, a theme of the faith family football podcast. And something about John that will interest you is he's from the state of Washington, right? Uh, and we were talking about Cooper Cup, right, from eastern Washington. And he talked about his dad being a preacher in the state of Washington. And I love it. And I encourage people to listen to the podcast that Max did with his girlfriend, right? And, man, that was a tremendous podcast and inspired me, man. So I'm a, I have a big debt of uh, gratitude to Max Brown. And it all well, starts you. with your parents, right? Your parents gave you an amazing work ethic. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I lost a little bit there. But, uh, yeah, sorry with my parents. Um, I don't lose track of uh, – I was fortunate to, to be raised by them. And when, uh, when you're referring to – when I re reference them in, in Vic's podcast and uh, people just kind of ask, oh, like, how did you get over that, right? I, 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 I failed, for lack of a better term, in, in, in right. the public eye. But uh, I do put it back on, on my parents. They're very level-headed. They, uh, they did not get super emotional with my successes and failures. And as a result, it allowed me to have a very strong relationship when things didn't go right and didn't go according to plan. I've seen it many, many times before where parents latch on to their kids' success. They get uh, super high when, when, when things are great and, and life's going well. But then when things are down, it becomes super obvious and the relationship's strained there. And so... I just talk about that. I just super grateful for their support. And, uh, no, they, they, they test me and they made me work hard and it wasn't just a hey, all sunshine and rainbows, but as a result, it's prepared me for, uh, when life did punch me in the mouth, uh, which yeah, super grateful for. No, absolutely. And that's some great insight, right? Cause we all learned it as kids, right? Just watching Tom Landry, right? You never get too high when things are really going good and you never get too low when things are, are going wrong. And we did a podcast with a uh, LA lead actress and she works at the ringer with Bill Simmons and she's with us, Sarah Lynn Robinson. 
And a theme of that is that even though she's not Meryl Streep, a million girls would kill for her career, right? And a million guys would kill to be the starting quarterback at USC. So you were coming out of high school, the number one recruit in the country, right? So who recruited you out of USC and how did that go down? Yeah, uh, most schools. I was very lucky, uh, very fortunate to, to really kind of have my pick of the litter. It came down to USC, Oklahoma, Alabama, and, and Washington was there as well. But uh, yeah, like you said, I really kind of had my, my pick of the litter, which was super, uh, super fortunate. But those were kind of the, uh, the final four schools, which was an uh, awesome experience looking back. So Sark recruited you at, at, for USC? It was my first offer uh, when he was at Washington. So like just after my freshman year. So kind of life coming full circle a few years later when he became a head coach. But uh, yeah, he was recruiting me at Washington. Yeah, no, no, that's extremely interesting. And I talked to her, right, Sarah Lynn Robinson, about winning editions, uh, auditions. I won an, an audition for a, uh, for, you know, reality show, court show. She was, she's won several of, of editions, right? In a great book I encourage you to read, is uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, right? Yep. He heard talked it. about, I had a restaurant, right, that I bought for $8,000, and I sold it for $800,000 six years later, right? Huge accomplishment. I had fun along the whole way. George Steinbrenner, owner of the Yankees, was a regular there. And looking back, at it, one of the biggest mistakes I made, one of the biggest mistakes Phil Knight made, right, he puts in his book, which he's extremely honest about. He talks about writing a bogus million-dollar check that he probably should have been arrested for, right? So it's kind of a, a confessional. And what I love about the podcast you did with your girlfriend is about you keeping it real. And I know you get that from the parents, right? <laughs> keeping it real, right? Because we meet, especially USC, right? Uh, University of Spoiled Children. I don't want to go there. But you meet a lot of people, fake people there, a lot of fake people in L.A. And you're real, right? From the state of Washington. And along those lines, you got to celebrate every single victory, man. So it's just so phenomenal that you were even a five-star. It's phenomenal that you got to USC. And maybe if you never played at USC, there's a lot of guys doing well who never even started with the third team quarterback. And you see him at a meeting, he's like the big celebrity, right? And why not, man? Life is short. We're all going to be dead. So those are, in, I mean, those are incredible victories to um, – to celebrate, man. And another one no, is totally, yeah. Oh, totally, yeah. No, I uh, I don't lose track of that, and I'm very wary that when I do speak up, is um, I had a lot of success in high school, a lot of things to be proud of, a lot of things in college to be proud of as well, the the captains and stuff. But I do speak to the more darker side because um, that's what people need to hear. I, people, I think people we don't talk we about it, and then when it happens, and then. And then what happens to people, uh, they just don't know how to handle it because it's never, ever talked about. It's never talked about the guy that were things that didn't work out for or the person that right. didn't get the job or whatever. And so that's definitely the lens I go through. And it's not uh, to say I, I don't appreciate those accomplishments. I definitely do. It's just uh, that's the other side that, that really hits home for me. And I know uh, it, it relates to other people as well. So I uh, think you're spot on both sides of the message for sure. No, it's something I followed from the beginning, right? Because I'm one of those dorks that listens to the Peristyle podcast. So right from the beginning, from you were a five-star, to so you're being interviewed by that guy, uh, Daniel Weber, and I'm listening to you. So that's why it's huge for me to see you in person, man. Uh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I remember those podcast days. Those are, uh, those are good times. Yeah, no, and uh, Mike Dicker came to my restaurant, and we had a conversation, and he told me, and this is one of the greatest victories in my mind that I've seen you have, is he told me that even though he had a fake quarterback battle, right, he always knew preseason, watching film, who he was going to pick as a starter, right? And you beat out Sam Darnold, fair and square. And this is what I love about you, right? You showed mental strength. So you can speak to mental strength. You go against Cody Kersler. And in my humble mind, you, you're a better athlete, better quarterback than uh, Cody Kessler. Maybe he was just a safe. Uh, you can speak to this because you're in it, right? So in my mind, as a business guy, I have an MBA. I have a master of business science. I have clients net worth $20 million and above, right? So from a business standpoint, uh, Cody Kessler was the safest choice. But you did not give up losing twice to a Cody Kessler. That in my mind, I felt you had better physical skills than uh 
Cody Kessler. Uh, and maybe you took a shot downfield every once in a while that the coaches didn't like, but come on, you're in college, you're supposed to have fun. You go out and you beat Sam Darnold, who ends up being the number one uh, draft choice in the NFL, man. That's a, that's, a, that's a feather in your cap. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I always joke around, uh, literally in the TV behind me, uh, that Sam and the Jets are playing, and uh, my story gets better the, the better he does, and, and we're buds, so no, I'm always rooting for him. But, yeah, like you said, those competition battles, I think a lot of the, the hardcore SC fans like yourself uh, remember it, but those kind of get brushed over, but those are a big part of me growing and, and learning about myself, competing against Cody and things not working out and not uh, not really having tons of success behind the behind the scenes. Like you grow as a lot uh, as, as a person for sure. And I think my gauge of, of hard work and testing myself and resiliency, that's kind of, it was kind of set in those competition battles. But yeah, like you said, it was neck and neck uh, with Cody there for a little bit. And then obviously with Sam as well. And uh, the competitor in me is still like, ah, I, I could be doing what he's doing, all that stuff. But the reality is I can't take anything away from him. He's uh, an NFL starting quarterback, a great one, and uh, a good dude as well. So easy to root for, for sure. Yeah, no, and if you ever watch Match Point, and I always think of uh, marginal utility, right? The stroke percentage between the number one golfer in the world and 100th, it's only 0.5%. Same thing in tennis. It's a very, very close between – and I remember – I never made it to college or anything, but uh, Tommy Carter, who, who won a, a national championship with Lou Holtz, second to Dee Marie Smith, and William Floyd won the national championship. He's the color guy of Florida State and won a Super Bowl with Steve Young. I used to destroy those guys on the basketball court. And I always thought about that, right? There's such a, a minute difference, right, between guys who have a long career in the NFL and guys who never go into it. And one thing I like to ask you, just from a business standpoint, uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about that. Was it a situation where uh, it was the hierarchy there would, would have been T. Martin, right? He's now the recruiting coordinator at Tennessee, wide receivers coach. Tyson Helton, right? Head coach of, uh, you know, Western Kentucky, uh, legacy family. The dad coached at Florida with Spurrier and then head coach at Memphis and now Clay, Clay Helton. Was it a situation where they were saying, let's get uh, Max on the field and let's not get too much film on Darnold and start Darnold uh, for the conference, for the conference games? Fair question. Haven't got that question in years, to be honest. So it'll be fun to kind of go back. But uh, obviously there's tons of factors at play. There's the fact that it's Helton's first season. There was the fact that you had Sam on the, uh, on the bench behind me. And I think everyone knew he would be great, but, that spring, I remember Helton sitting down with Sam and I and both saying, hey, I got two NFL starting quarterbacks on my team, and I got a decision to make this fall of which one to go with, and uh, it's a great spot to be in because you had two quarterback talent, but the reality is someone's going to get the short end of the stick, and the reality is I didn't get it done. That, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the honest truth, but I think there are some things you look back, and then if, if the factors had, had gone a different way, maybe my career is different, but those are the stories that, 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 that drive you crazy when you think about it, and at the end of the day, confident with my investment, even though it didn't work out. But you're spot on. I think uh, everyone knew what Sam was uh, as a backup. But I think there was a lot of people that were saying, hey, this number four guy could get it done as well. And Sam will get his shot in a few years. Obviously, it didn't work that way. But uh, that quarterback room when I was there was talented. I mean, you talk about Cody, you talk about Sam, and then uh, myself and other guys as well. It was a, it was a stacked room. But that's the, that's the ruthless part about the quarterback position is only one guy plays. So um, factors got to line up in your favor for, for things to work out. Yeah, and what I love about you, man, is that you keep coming back, right? And you see a lot of snowflake guys that transfer right away. The first time you lost the battle to Kurt Clay, oh, I'm going to transfer, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Things get crazy, right? And life goes in cycles. So in business and somewhere, you're going to see a Clay Hilton again. And you're the guy in the room. We're just fans. We're just saying, throw, but you're the guy in the arena, in the field. You know what you're talking about. So me speculating, right, before we go to Pitt, me speculating on Clay Helton, observing him the last 10 years, right? Uh, he looks like, and, and, I, and I take this from the legacy because I lived 20 years in Florida, and, and I know when he was, his dad was in Gainesville, he seems like an aw shucks guy, right? 
But at the end of the day, he's extremely calculated. You don't stay at USC and be able to deal what he's dealt with in a, in a way from a bit, from a purely business standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of lessons to learn from Clay Helton, right? Because he knows how to maintain relationships with a lot of toxic people, right? You look at uh, Kiffin, you look at Sark, right? Sark is an alcoholic and now he's working his way back. Uh, Kiffin, right? Uh, we saw his personality conflicts he had with Al Davis, uh, problems he had at Tennessee, problems he had with Nick Saban, right? Problems he had with the athletic director at FAU. So, but Clay Helton, right, survives that. He becomes a head coach. He deals with uh, Pat Hayden. He deals with Lynn Swan. <laughs> and then he went over Mike Bone and the university president. He did such a wonderful job from a business networking standpoint, giving the ball to Mike Bone, the game ball, giving a hug to the USC president. And he's entrenched, right? And he has a $20 million buyout and he's making $5 million a year. So whatever you want to say about Clay Helton, from a business standpoint, he's an extremely intelligent, smart guy. And it's wonderful that you got that opportunity to be around him. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's one of those things, like obviously uh, Clay Helton, enjoyable, likable guy. I think just like right. anyone in life, you're going to have people that uh, – People that love you and people that maybe uh, don't have the fondest of memories. I probably fall in the latter if we're just being honest. Uh, right. How my uh, my career played out with as a result of his decisions or lack of decisions. But, but he uh, screwed you over, right? He's, he's got, even though he has that Oshucks, you know, Gomer Pyle thing, right? He's a I, very cunning guy. At the end of the day, the whole screwed over thing, I feel like players use that all the time. And most of the time, it's just not the case. Right. But at the end of the day, he made decisions or lack or lack of decisions that uh, did not help my career. And so me being a human. Was he always player, honest with you? He never lied to me, but uh, I would not say the, the, the full depiction of all factors at play was, was given to me. But I mean, at the end of the day, I, I totally understand why he did everything he did, but uh, I can't ignore even at 25 being years of move that those decisions could have been handled in a different way to help my career. And I do need to be honest with myself in that regard, but uh, I respect you did what he had to do. And uh, as a result, he saved his job and uh, won a lot of games as a result. So I yeah, CYA, CYA. And then that's why, uh, even though it's family football, my dad's been a minister for 51 years. Anyone that claims religion, I'm always highly skeptical. <laughs> but we move on to your resiliency, man. Because that's, that's when I started becoming even a bigger Max Brown fan, man. When you decided, hey, heck, I'm going to go to Pitt, right? And Coach Narduzzi, and a big, big fan of his, uh, the defenses he put together in Michigan State with Antonio, right? And then the, kind of the way he went about it was, was pretty cool. And then if you could tell us that process, because I know – uh, from what I read about you and your family, you guys did your research. And that's one of the biggest things I see people not do in business is they never do your research. And you did uh, your research before going from USC to Pitt. With, yeah, without a doubt. My transfer process, this is before the transfer portal, but uh, it was pretty much the same process. And like you said, I think at every step of the way, I've always been super calculated, always been kind of evaluating every decision. But with the transfer one, for sure, like, that was, the, that was the biggest decision. I mean, I only get one more season, one more shot. And I remember sitting, uh, sitting on a Sunday afternoon just like this with a huge whiteboard and literally going down every single school in the country, um, Division One school in the country, and, and researching their quarterback situation. And so I had a good gauge of, all right, there's about 30 schools in the country that could potentially be in the grad school market. Right. And, uh, and from there, sure enough, like three of those schools were able to reach out to me and uh, I was calculated in the fact that I got my permission to contact other schools in like October. So it was like mid season, which is goofy, but at the same time, I had to look out for my best interest at that time and start talking to schools and start trying to figure it out. And to make a long story short, I ended up sitting, uh, going to Pitt. And, uh, yeah, like you said, it was a school that had grad transfers in the past, had graduated two senior quarterbacks. They had a need. They were actually the number one offense in the country and 2016 when I had transferred uh, the, the year before I had transferred. So uh, in hindsight, it didn't necessarily work out for me on the field as much at Pitt, but uh, in terms of the decision itself, like you said, calculated for sure, thought out for sure, and a game plan full intact. 
No, and, and you agree with me on this? It, I don't not believe in the word failure. In, and I, in the way I look at it, things worked out at Pitt, as crazy as it thinks, right? Uh, for me, and I tell my clients all the time, and everybody that works with me on the podcast, I tell them, you, you don't use the word failure. Failure is if you do not learn from it, right? And, and, and as smart as you are, you learned a lot at Pitt. Now, did you have a quarterback battle at Pitt? Who was the offense coordinator at Pitt at that time? Yeah, it was uh, Sean Watson. Yeah, it was okay. uh, T- Teddy Ridgewater's uh, offensive coordinator in college. That's how what he's – that was his most famous stop. Right, and I graduated from the University of South Florida, and I'm the head of the uh, alumni group. So I had, uh, you know, a lot of conversations with Coach Charlie Strong, and that was his coordinator, and Teddy Bridgewater yep. was the uh, head coach of the University of Louisville. Uh, yep. Scott Watson is a good coordinator, and you won that quarterback battle at uh, Pitt. I did, yeah. I was battling with uh, – a guy who's actually the third string for the Cowboys this year, uh, Ben DiNucci. So he was a redshirt sophomore when I was there. But, uh, yeah, won the uh, Always job. Always my lawyer. And I remember I saw that Pitt was going to play Rice, and I, and I read the Pittsburgh Gazette, and it said that Max Brown was going to start. And I'm like, Max Brown's going to start. Pull for Max Brown because yeah, Max man. Brown did not give up. Max Brown came back, and, man, Thank you, man. That was a great performance you had against those Rice Isles that, that day. No, I appreciate you following, following along. You're, uh, you're up to date with everything. No, that, that game was sweet. That was like the, the first game where I'm all probably your biggest together. fan of that of your family, man. Biggest Max Brown. Yeah, I love that. I love that, man. <laughs> I love that. But that, no, that Rice game was – that was special, and I thought that was going to continue for the rest of the year, but obviously got uh, cut short. But that game was awesome. It was literally – as pretty much close to a perfect offensive game as uh, as a team, really as a unit that you could uh, you could line up. You were locked in. So because I go back to the Dan uh, Weber days saying, oh, you know, Kessler probably beat him out because Kessler just throws those five yard passes and every once in a while Max would like to throw it deep, right? And I guess Clay likes to play it safe. He wants to keep his job with let it out. But that rice game you got to yeah uh, you got to go deep a couple times and test out that arm because uh, am I wrong that you had a great uh, – probably still do, man, once you heal up, you had a great long ball. You had a, a great deep ball. The long ball is what it's all about. Yeah, I know that Rice game was – it was one of those things everyone's like, oh, yeah, it, 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 the, 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 the switch turned on, all that stuff. And to me, it was right. just like that's what I've been doing all the time in practice for years, and it finally just came to life. And so I was, I was appreciative. It was awesome. But it was one of those things. It was more of just kind of a sigh of relief, sigh of, relief of like, all right, finally, man. And uh, – not to be a victim or anything, but that's definitely uh, the, the the feeling inside was like just kind of a deep breath of, hey, it, it finally paid off kind of thing. Yeah, no, no, totally. And, and before we go to the next step, I'm thinking, you know, in practice, man, um, what were some of the right receivers you hit on the long ball? Juju Smith, uh, Dory Jackson, all those guys you hit them with uh, the Max Brown long ball. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh... I mean, names like Darius Rogers, he probably had the best hands of any receiver I ever threw with. Jo- Juju yeah. was obviously fun to play with. Uh, but like we've talked about, I was with the second stringers a lot. So I can't, some of the walk-ons, the Robbie Colances, the David Melstroms, like the uh, Devon Flournoy when I was earlier on, like a Victor Black, like some of those guys, a Jane A. Harris, some of those guys coming to front of mind, uh, Isaac Whitney, uh, guys that like I play with more because I didn't always have the luxury of the the, the top, top dudes. And became super close with kind of those, those, those second tier guys, which uh, will always have a special, uh, special place in my heart. Yeah, no, no, totally. You'll be seeing these guys for the next 30 years. Believe me. Uh, after your soldier's surgery, right. That would have taken most people out to be honest. It, I would have been depressed for 10 years and I followed that. And then like a couple of years later, man, I see you on TV, you're smiling, you know, you, you, and you can get now I'm old. I'm like 50 years old. So I never believe what people say. I always look at them. <laughs> and I can tell that you had a great foundation with your parents and you have an enormous amount of mental strength that now you come back from that shoulder injury, you're happy, you're laughing, you're attacking your business life. I think you even were for a second with Gary V, right? Because they say yep. you're the measure of the five people around you, right? So your parents bring your average way up and, man, you've done a great job just coming up, smiling, and, and, and attacking life. What was your major in school as well? 
No, I appreciate that. I was a uh, comm major uh, undergrad, and I got my MBA from USC. And, uh, I got my master's in marketing from uh, from Pittsburgh. So, took advantage of the system a little bit while uh, while I was in it. Nice, nice. Well, I always run into the USC network, and thank you having Max Brown on the podcast. I got you. I got you. Yeah, you're right on, man. It was going to warm me up about those uh, those conversations with USC uh, people. So you work with Gary V. Because that's a role too. He's a he's a legend. He's the you know he's taking the baton from Tony Robbins as yep. number one hype, uh, you know hype. Yeah, this motivational guy, and uh, he owns a piece of the Jets now. Yeah, he I mean, he's still trying to own the piece of the Jets. That's 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 <laughs> that's, that's, that's the main goal. But uh, no, he's a stud. That was my first job out of college, and nice. Uh, and, and to your point, I think I was. Don't get me wrong. It was it was tough to move on, tough to hang up the cleats. But I think at the end of the day, I just I really had had no regrets. It didn't feel like. Uh, I mean, I always talk about this. You can always go one more, right? You can literally oh, and whatever. There's always another more. There's always one more rep. But there is another life, and uh, I wasn't pleased with where I kind of was at in in football, and it felt like time to t- time to turn the page. And um, there's just there's no regrets in my playing career which has allowed me to like you said to still smile to still choose to kind of look at it in a positive light and um yeah I worked for Gary for a year basically all of 2019 it was an awesome experience for people that don't know him he's kind of the 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 leading mogul I guess you could say in terms of social media so it was a great guy to learn from and I know social media rubs some people the wrong way but at the end of the day it's here to stay so it was awesome to uh to learn how to execute it to uh help out your life and use it as a tool, which was the biggest thing for sure. Yeah. No, and I'll make sure all you guys connect, man. Corey Jackson, uh, John Bronson, uh, who's one of his better friends is Larry Fitzgerald and life after football, man. Cause you guys are told in, in John Bronson, we were clear on that podcast uh, and live stream. I'll send it to you. You know, when he got screwed over by uh, awesome. Winston Hunt, Winston Hunt, right? Is he, Winston Hunt brings in a ham sandwich, uh, tight end from Pittsburgh, Steelers that he knew the offense, but the, the athletic uh, prowess between Bronson and him was ridiculous. But you mentally come back from that. And, and, and for you guys, all three guys, I'll do whatever I can to help because in my restaurant, I did see a Lawrence Taylor come in, right? And Lawrence Taylor had lost all his money and he got into drug addiction, you know, and yep. his mental strength of doing stuff after the same thing with Daryl Strawberry came in my restaurant. So that's why I am so ecstatic and so proud of you that you've shown that mental strength and to be doing so well in business right now. So l- let us know everywhere you're at. We get 20,000 downloads a month. We make sure, you know, help your numbers and get that going too as well. No, I appreciate that. No, thanks for those words. And yeah, in terms of where people can find me, uh, obviously like you've talked about, share some of my bits and pieces of my story on, on all platforms, but uh, Instagram, it's Max Brown and Brown has an E at the end. Uh, and then link, link up with me on LinkedIn as well. Max Brown again. And then uh, I have a YouTube channel. Um, also, once again, just my name, some football and life content there. And if you're even going even more so I'm on Twitter at Max Brown four and then TikTok uh, at Brown with an E at the end, Max. So kind of everywhere lean on my, uh, my name and yeah, man, this is, uh, this was awesome. Yes, thank you. Congratulations to Matt Brown. Thank you so much for coming on. Faith, family, football. And we also have Ben Raslaff. He is uh, the All-American FCS uh, receiver for Houston Baptist football. We have Faith and Family football with him. Nice. Uh, he will be in the NFL as well. And he has a great story. So it's about perseverance. It's about never giving up. And we always close with Winston Churchill, who got us through World War II, You make a living from your labor, but you make a life from what you give. Thank you for listening to the ESBC podcast.